look at the uh, liver lobules, <clears throat> the functional unit of the liver. Here's one close up. All the fat sites are in the lobule. They surround the central vein. Blood drains from the corners of this hexagonal shaped lobule towards the central vein. And along the way, as the blood percolates from corners to the center, the hepatocytes can extract the nutrients, do everything they need to, to store and metabolize all the nutrients you ate from your meal. They also produce bile. Bile travels the other way towards the corners and there's a biliary system within the liver to drain it, to get it out through the bile duct. When you look at it under the microscope, it's basically what you see there. You can't see too much details. I just point to the two areas. The little circle in the middle, that's the central vein. And at the corners, you have what's called the portal triad. It's basically what you have here. Look at the bottom image. You have a hexagon. That's the cent uh, central vein in the middle. Each corner of the liver lobule, you have a portal triad, which is a, a trio of three structures. You have a little branch, just draw a little red circle. Well, it would be at every corner. It would be a branch of the hepatic artery. You would have a branch of the portal vein. of the bile duct. Two, three, four is what I call the portal triad. About seventy five percent of the blood comes from the portal vein, then twenty five from the hepatic artery, and then drain towards the center through these structures called liver sinusoids. They're basically blood vessels, and they're a mix of the portal blood and the hepatic artery blood. So blood is entering from both vessels. And as it, as it does so, it's facing the hepatocytes. Draw a double row there. Hepatocytes, the liver cells. Okay. <clears throat> so they have access to the flowing blood. And by the time the blood reaches the central vein, it's on the way out to the hepatic vein, the drainage system. Um, I want to take a close-up view of the hepatocytes next to the, the sinusoidal blood in this slide here.
Notice the hepatocytes are always kind of two rows together. Let's draw two rows of hepatocytes. There's one row. There's one hepatocyte drawing. Two rows of hepatocytes, and on either side, you have these two different, well, you have two membranes. You have membranes that face inwards, one that face outwards, and I label them apical basal lateral. One on the inside, apical, one on the outside, basal lateral. Remember, it's receiving blood from portal vein, or this is a branch of the portal vein. I'll just say portal blood. <clears throat> So receiving blood from a hepatic artery or a branch of it. Hepatic artery blood, the oxygenated blood. And so it's kind of a mix of that blood. The blood is flowing by. There's a gap or a space between the basal lateral membrane and the sinusoid capillary wall. Um, it's called the, that space has a name, it's called the space of Desse, space from here to there. Space of Desse. That's D-I-S-S-E. You would have a sinusoid on the other side. arrangement, the sinusoidal blood is exposed to a hepatocyte every time. Every row of hepatocytes has access to blood flowing by it. Now, on the inside, the apical membranes of the hepatocytes form what's called the bile canaliculi. So I'll draw bile in here in green. See the green stuff here in the middle? I don't like how they illustrate it. It looks like the bile canaliculi is its own duct, but it's not. My understanding is it's not its own duct. It's formed by a gap between the cell membranes, right? So it's a gap, not a duct. It's going to drain out to a branch of you know the, the biliary system I taught you right before the break. So all this green stuff is going to flow out. Okay, little 
bile ductule there. It's all going to drain to hepatic vein. Excuse me, it's all going to drain to hepatic duct, the common hepatic duct, then bile duct. All right. Now, bile itself, the key component are the bile salts. Now, you don't have to know the molecular structure of cholic acid or ketodeoxycholic acid, just know them as bile salts. And the important molecular thing about them is that they have one polar side or one hydrophilic side and one hydrophobic side. If you're trying to emulsify fats, which is what bile salts do, the goal is digestion. The first part of lipid digestion is to take the big fat droplets and break them up into smaller ones. If you do that, the smaller fat droplets are better exposed to the pancreatic lipase so you can digest the triglycerides. So the first step is emulsification, shown here. So what I'll write for this slide, bile salts emulsify fats. Fat emulsification is not true lipid digestion. It's just breaking it up into little parts so you can absorb it. So it's essential to process though. So the bile salts have uh, this hydrophobic side, hydrophilic side. That side is basically facing the watery medium in the lumen. Okay. Uh, face out. What faces in towards the lipid drop is the hydrophobic side. Hydrophobic side face in. It surrounds fat droplet. There's the picture in your book. Big fat globule at the top. You want to break it up into smaller ones so you can absorb it. There's the bile salts surrounding it. Those will kind of um, be transported into the lacteal. That's the structure in the villi of the small intestine. Absorbed by lacteals. Okay, we can move on from this. <clears throat> Here's true fat digestion. When you break it into smaller fat droplets, more of the fat is exposed to the lipase from the pancreas. So fat droplet absorbed by lacteal, fat droplet exposed to lipase. Um, this is a triglyceride. So what triglycerides, how they're digested is the lipase will cleave the fatty acids off so they're free. Lipase cleaves off fatty acids from the glycerol backbone. Of triglycerides, I'll just say TGs. It's the free fatty acid that can circulate in the blood and enter the muscle cell from metabolism. Exercise increases uh, lipase activity. So that's true fat digestion. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the small intestine now. So we, we're done with liver, I'm shifting gears. Before the break, we did duodenum, liver and pancreas and stomach, that was a lot. The small intestine is simply a tube, six to seven meters long, about 21 feet. It goes jejunum, then ileum. And it's color coded here so you can easily see the three parts of the small intestine. Duodenum, the 
first 10 inches or so. Then you have that little flexure, then jejunum, then ilium, then starts the large intestine. You got pictures in your book? More anatomically correct. You lift up the fat apron, the greater momentum. You lift up the transverse colon. If I point to innards anywhere up here, it's jejunum. Anywhere down there, it's ilium. Okay, so general locations, jejunum up here, ilium down there. So I showed you this picture earlier. I said like the intestines, like you gather a, a python in a cloth bag and gather it up, that's kind of or you would cut off the small intestine at the cloth bag or at the mesentery. So it's held in place by the mesentery. The root of the mesentery is anchored to the back body wall. The main function of the intestines, it is the main site of absorption. So we talk about the modifications for absorption of all the food stuff. You got the plica, the villi, and the microvilli. Okay. So um, you should go through those. So here's an unfolding of the intestinal wall. You can see all these grooves. You can see that without a microscope. Okay. Uh, those are the circular folds. Those are the plica. So if you look at this close up, let me draw this right there. Small intestine, modifications for absorption. There's a little red line here. Let me start by drawing that red line. That's the muscularis mucosa. Rest the epithelium over it. Those are the villi. Each little finger like projection is a villi. So in the stomach, the epithelium was thrown into pits. In the uh, intestine, it's like you got these villi that stick up like fingers. Okay, so um, all these foldings help increase the absorptive area. So this circular fold, this whole thing is a fold. It's a plica. That circular fold is basically a folding of the submucosa. If you remember our, our wall layers, the black squiggly line, the villi, that's the epithelium. So what underlies the epithelium? Lamina propria. And then deep to that, is MM. So it's like all this green connective tissue I'm drawing is LP. It's above the MM, the muscularis mucosa. So it's part of the mucosa, underlies the epithelium. I'm just going to draw it all right there. All the green stuff. LP, lamina propria. Okay, the black line is the epithelium. <clears throat> okay, so deep to the MM is the submucosa, right? So I'll, I'll use blue for 
for some to come south. And just fold it all up in here. So that's why we say plica is a folding of the submucosa because it folds all the way up in there. Uh, so villi are a folding of the mucosa. <coughs> a third level of folding or microvilli is a folding of the plasma membrane of each epithelial cell. Folding of plasma membrane. That's what they're showing you there. I have other pictures to show you the villi better. There's villi. One thing about the villi, it contains the intestinal capillaries and lacteal. I think I mentioned that before. Villi. Here is the brush border, folding of each epithelial cell. I even said something about that. The brush border enzymes, that's where they're located. They help complete the digestion. We know that. Notice that you don't only have villi. It goes villi, crypt, villi, crypt. There's a crypt, there's a villi. You have things that stick up and then things that are pits called intestinal crypts. So the basic arrangement of the mucosa Crips. So if it sticks up, it's a villi. If it's a pit, it's a crypt. Kind of like that. Intestinal crypt. An older term, you may see it in one of my study guides. They're called the crypts of Lieberkuhn, and they have these panic cells. Crypts of Lieberkuhn. Okay, in either case, they're with panic cells. They usually stain red, they're at the base of the crypt. The crypts help secrete digestive things that aid in absorption, but the pata cells will be at the base of the crypt. And they usually stain red. All right, so remember those brush border enzymes. Note those, I mentioned them before. You're just finishing off the digestion. You have some monomers here. Uh, but the brush border enzymes digested. They broke the bonds of these polymers, made them into monomers, and you can absorb them into the intestinal capillary. And let's remember, we, we did look at this model before. I just have some labels on, labels off, so you can study that model. Same picture, just a different aspect. Now let's move on to the colon and large intestine. This is a nice picture. This is what it looks like. Um, let's see. So let's go through this. We just did small intestine. Where does the small intestine end and the large intestine begin? Right there. 
Here's the end of the ilium. There's the first part of the large intestine called the cecum. How can you tell uh, small from large intestine? Large intestine, also called colon. Well, one is have these little bands. I can't show you here, but um, the cecum, the muscle layer, we have circular and longitudinal layer. In the colon, the longitudinal layer reduces to three thin bands called tania coli. You can see that band here from the picture. longitudinal layer reduced to a thin band of ribbon and the structure is called tania coli. You got you got three of them. Three thin bands. I thought I'd use the app to kind of show you that. <coughs> Try to highlight it in green. There's one highlighted. There's another. Let's do multi selection. That one. That one. There's one underneath there too. Bam. So I didn't highlight all of them, but see, see the where I've highlighted in green. Those three thin bands, two on the top there. The small intestine doesn't have that. Also, look at the pocketed appearance of the small intestine, or of the large intestine. Those pockets are called hostra. That's another way you could tell. Because that longitudinal layer is reduced to three bands, when they contract, they create the pockets. All right, so here is the first part of the small intestine, the cecum. Okay, highlight it in green. Now, what should be mentioned is this little appendage right there. That's the vermiform appendix. Appendicitis is when, well, think about what's coming in here. It's receiving all the food stuff. By the time you finish absorption and you get to here, you're basically a brown sludge. Your fecal matter is here. And if it clogs this area, you strangulate the blood supply and it starts to you know, fill. And you have to remove it before the appendix bursts. You don't want fecal matter in the peritoneum. Okay, uh, so that's appendicitis. But that structure is the vermiform appendix. I'm going to say look for the vermiform appendix hanging off the cecum. Cecum. C-E-C-U-M. 
I'm going to remove the sequel wall so we can see inside there. If you look inside, right there, let's highlight it in green there. That's the ileocecal valve. So that's where the cecum is receiving the food stuff from ileum. Look for. now is basically all, absorption is done. You basically want to absorb mostly water that will compact the feces and fat soluble vitamins. Absorb water and fat soluble vitamins. I'll just use the app to help me do this here. Let me uh, put that stuff back on. Let me just isolate the large intestine again. So the part highlighted in green is basically the ascending colon. Now, when we went from ileum to cecum, we went retro again. The intestines are intra jejunum ileum. And then the ascending colon is retroperitoneal. I'll just put retro. It stops by bending at the top there. Where you are is you're by the liver. And we are on the right side. So, uh, that bend is called the hepatic flexure or right colic flexure because we're by the liver. So the ascending colon goes to right colic flexure. You can call it hepatic flexure if you want. The longest part of the transverse colon is that hammock looking thing, I'll highlight it. That's the transverse colon. So now we're back to intraperitoneal. This kind of sagging hammock loop shape is accommodating the stomach. Okay. So if you have a tummy ache, maybe it's your stomach, it could be transverse colon. Uh, they're right next to each other. right next to the stomach, and let's remember, the greater omentum attaches to the greater curvature of the stomach, drapes under, and attaches to this structure, the transverse colon. And we also said the transverse colon is attached to the back body wall by the transverse mesial colon. So don't forget those two things. I'll put them here as reminders. Greater omentum is one, attaches to it, and also the transverse mesial colon. is the other. You get all the way to the left side, you have another flexure. You can call it the left colic flexure or splenic flexure, since the spleen is right by here. if you like. And then the fecal matter as it's being compacted moves down. We're in the descending colon. 
The transverse colon, I should have wrote, was intraperitoneal. I'll put intra. And then it goes back to retro. At the left colon flexure, you go to descending colon, that is retro. It goes all the way down, and it starts to bend as it gets close to the sacral. That S-shaped part of the colon is called the sigmoid colon. Highlighted in green. We're going to stay retro now. The sigmoid colon leads to the rectum, which is a holding chamber for the feces. There's the rectum. It's kind of hard to notice, but um, that's where tania coli ends. Let me see if I Tania coli, highlighted in green. Remember that thin ribbon is the longitudinal layer. The longitudinal layer is fully restored as a full layer at the rectum. That's why you, you don't see it as a thin ribbon, it's fully restored. longitudinal layer fully restored. That's the end. You just hold it there until you get um, the urge to go and you go to the bathroom and you relax the external anal sphincter for defecation. Okay, so that's the anal canal and the internal anal sphincter. All right. <clears throat> so going back to the slides, Kind of left off there. We can just fly through these now since I already talked about the whole large intestine. There's this picture here. Which colon is that? The gray one. Transverse. Very good. Greater omentum. Uh, yeah, your small intestine. Not much else to see there. Let's move on. Okay, here's the small intestines. Uh, what would you call 526? What do you think you're going for there? Titanium coli, very good. What you call 491, green, green tube? Duodenum, duodenum. What about 495 and 496? Pancreas, pancreatic duct. Yeah, so we see 528, probably going for a descending colon there. Uh, if I said identify this bend, what would you call it? Is it the right or the left? Yeah, it's on the right, the paddock. Yeah, sure. There's a picture of the rectum anus. I want to talk about the blood supply to the, the colon and the small intestine. So we can go back, circle back, and talk about the superior mesenteric artery, when I taught duodenum earlier, I told you it goes over the duodenum. short, superior mesenteric artery. Remember, it goes over the duodenum. It kind of goes off to the right. It basically supplies blood to the jejunum, to the ileum, and to all of the colon up to left colic flexure, although you can't see that in this picture. Supplies jejunum, ilium, 
colon up to left colon flexure. Uh, the picture on the left is showing you the superior mesenteric artery going off to the right. And as it goes off to the right, it gives up all these branches to jejunum and ilium. And here you see all these branches applying blood all the way up to left colon flexure. On this picture here, here is the SMA. Okay, it's giving off all these branches. These branches are cut off, but they would go to the small intestines. And these branches up to here are for the SMA. <clears throat> so this is a model we have in the room. And um, turn the lights off, you can see it a little better. So if you turn these small intestines around, you can see all these little cut lines, cut tubes. Those are the cut tubes of the branches for SMA that fit on that large intestine. So that model shows it pretty good. Let's move on. Once again, all these cut branches fit right there. Okay, the inferior mesenteric artery is obviously inferior to the superior mesenteric artery. So these three single branches off abdominal order from top to bottom are celiac trunk, superior mesenteric artery, inferior mesenteric artery. If you can see the termination of, or excuse me, the end of the abdominal order as it bifurcates into common iliacs, you know you're inferior. You know you're superior if you see it going over the wide. Okay. The inferior mesenteric artery goes off to the left goes off to the left, and it's applying blood to everything past the left colon flexure. Inferior mesenteric artery, IMA, goes off to the left. pretty much distal colon, everything past left colon flexure. I'll just say distal colon. So you got a quick side by side showing you the blood supply for the superior mesenteric, supplying everything up to left colon flexure, and then inferior mesenteric had taken over all the way down. All right, let's talk about the venous drainage, which is called, um, actually, yeah, so do that. Uh, talk about that one. Let me mention this one. Okay, this one was on your last test. I remember I labeled something there, superior rectal artery. Okay, this is a good model to take a look at because you got identify green thing. The vermiform appendix is actually lymphoid tissue. Okay, that's its function. The lips, ileal cecal valve, making 542, that tube there, end of the ilium. This whole pouch, cecum, ascending colon, descending colon. How do I know that's the superior mesenteric artery? What's this green tube? The one that goes over it. So therefore, I deduce that one is inferior, and also I know it supplies blood to this. That's another clue I can use to identify it. Okay, that's a good picture to study. All right, let's talk about the portal vein called first pass. Because all of this venous drainage doesn't go to inferior vena cava. You don't even see it in the picture. It first passes through liver. Anything you stick in your mouth, vitamins, french fries, potato chips, fruit, supplements, 
expensive supplements that you buy. It doesn't go to your body unless it goes to your liver first. I don't hardly take any supplements. Uh, I, I worry about what it'll do to my liver. It goes to your liver first. It has to. There's no other way. Um, what you got here is superior mesenteric vein, inferior mesenteric vein. You're going to have splenic vein, merge with the inferior mesenteric vein. through portal vein. And that is where you have liver. So that's what's being illustrated to you there. That's the uh, portal circulation. First pass through the liver, and then what drains the liver? Uh, the single venous drainage is basically hepatic veins. Here, let me see if I can show, show you the hepatic vein. Oops. Now let's jump to this picture here. Let me show you the unlabeled. Identify this vein. Well, if I see it going over the duodenum, it's the superior. Here's the inferior merging with splenic, and then they merge going into portal vein, into the liver. But this is portal vein. What are all these? Hepatic vein going into the eye. IVC, inferior vena cable. Okay. The next slide are the histology of the GI tract, but you know, I posted the one, I don't teach from these anymore. It's like, these are from like a long time ago, when you were probably in the fifth grade or something. <laughs> But I've left them there because they're still good pictures. What I've been doing is I've been taking pictures of, from our collection on this scope. And I posted those on Canvas. Did you see them? And I'll teach those Monday. I'm going to stop now and basically dismiss class unless you would like to have a presentation on the GI track. If you do, stick around. If not, see you Monday.